got a word for you on this morning. I want to preach from a topic, breaking news, breaking news. I don't know if you remember this, but when, when I was young, we used to watch the, our TV shows, and oftentimes you'll be in the middle of watching a good show. It could be a football game or something. They, you know, they're driving about the score, and immediately something will come on the TV and flash breaking news and it would pretty much interrupt your program. And the passage of scripture I want to read here today is basically Jesus saying, breaking news. In Luke chapter 4, verse 14, it reads, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogue, synagogue, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue, were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Breaking news. Now when the crowd read this scripture, they were thinking about what Isaiah was talking about was the year of Jubilee. Now, the year of Jubilee, I don't know if you know about the year of Jubilee, but if you read Leviticus chapter 25, it'll tell you all about the year of Jubilee where on the 50th, every 50 years, all of the captives shall be set free. Anybody that was in debt, all of their debt would be restored. They, they would no longer have debt. Anybody that had property that was taken away from them, the property will be restored. And this is what they're thinking about. But Jesus was saying that you got it all wrong. Breaking news. I am the one that Isaiah was prophesying about. I am the one that would bring healing to the land. I'm the one that would bring joy in your heart. I'm the one that can set you free I'm the one to bring deliverance unto you. Amen. Breaking news. You know, the breaking news is basically the good news of Jesus Christ. He said that I come to preach the gospel unto the poor. In other words, the gospel means good news. I come to preach the good news to the poor, the ones, those who are lacking, those who are destitute, those who are in need. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but there's been a lot of bad news in the world. And I believe we're living in a time in a society today where we need to hear some good news. Amen. Because when I say I want to preach a message about the good news, there must be an assumption that there's bad news. And there isn't bad news. Bad news in the world today is that there is sin in the world. There's sin in the world. Sin every time you turn on the television, there's bad news. Social media, bad news. And the thing about it is that we repost bad news. We post and repost the bad news of the world. But I'm believing today when we leave here, we're going to begin to post the good news of Jesus Christ. Because the bad news is that sin is in the world. The Bible says it like this in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned 
and fell short of the glory of God. Meaning that sin is literally means to miss the mark. He's saying that we all have missed the mark somewhere in our lives. If you haven't missed the mark, just keep on living. <laughs> Amen. Because sin is running rapidly through our world. Matter of fact, we have a nature, a sin nature now because of Adam. In Genesis chapter 2. Verse 15, it reads this. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. That was the commandment of the Lord. The day you eat is the day you die. Now, we know that Adam did not physically die the moment he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But there was a spiritual separation that happened to Adam. He was separated from God. And I'm here to tell you now that we all will be separated from God if we're living a life of sin. Sin separates us from God. I'm going to tell you this. Sin has a price. And the price of sin is death. The day you eat is the day you die. We all will die one day. For the Bible says it like this. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, I know we all feel good and we all feel healthy and we all got a lot of stuff going on in our lives that's real good. But the truth of the matter is that we all are going to die. See, but when you're in Christ, you only die one time. But when you're outside of Christ, you have three deaths. You have a spiritual death, a physical death, and then there's an eternal death that you will experience. Romans 5, 12 reads like this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, death through sin. In this way, death came on all people. Sin has a price, and that price of sin is death. For Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. I like how James says it in James chapter 1, verse 13. He says, when tempted, no man should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So it's a snowball effect. Each person, when he is tempted, they are dragged away. And see, a lot of us is in that dragging state right now. Where sin is dragging you, you're pulling and you're trying to fight back. But it's dragging you because of the desires that's in your heart. Not only is it dragging you by your own evil desires, but it's in you. The word entice me, it's alluring you. And that's what the enemy want to do. The enemy wants to allure you to temptation so that he can destroy you. His sole purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. The devil want to destroy your life and ultimately cause you to die. That's why the Bible tells us be vigilant, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 
There's a desire that's in us that's dragging us to do wrong. Because the devil want to cause a spiritual separation between you and God. He said that once he's dragging you, he begins to entice you. That word entice is like a, a, a fisherman with a bait on the hook. And he's dangling it out there for you. Saying, you know you want it. Come on and get it. And that desire that's been in your heart and on your mind all week long, he's putting it in front of you. Come on, desires of the world. Come on, how, how did he tempt Jesus? He tempted Jesus, amen, by the desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Come on, you know you want to drink. Come on, come on, hang on out with your, your partners and, and drink and smoke and do the things of the world. You know you want, you want wealth, you want fame. Come on, go ahead and backstab somebody and go ahead and cheat somebody. Go ahead and lie to somebody. He's alluring you by the evil desires that is in our hearts because he want to bring forth death. Not only does sin bring forth death, but it brings forth a shame in our lives. It causes shame once you have committed sin against God. I don't know, maybe it's just me, you know, like when I used to be a young believer and I began to do things outside of, you know, Christ that I know that I should not be doing as a born-again believer. And, you know, as you begin to think about those things, you know that you shouldn't even be thinking the way you're thinking because you have the Spirit of God in you that convicts you when you're thinking wrong thoughts. And not even that, even when you begin to give into it, you begin to, you know, make progress to go do the sin. The spirit of God in you is telling you, you shouldn't do that. You, you know you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be going over there. You shouldn't go hang out. You shouldn't go, you know, have this affair. You, you, you shouldn't do this. And soon as you get there and you do the sin, you commit the act, now there's a guilt and a shame over you. And you said, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. I, I shouldn't have done that. And now you have this guilt where you're feeling this small, real little right about now, and you're sensitive, thinking that everybody else is against you now because you're ashamed, like Adam and Eve, they hid themselves. So now you don't even want to be in contact with any of the people of God. Don't go to small group. Don't come to church. You're hiding from everybody that says anything about God because of that guilt and shame that's in our lives. Sin brings shame. Sin also brings a separation. Isaiah said like this. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short that it can't save, nor his ear too dull that he can't hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. That sin brings a separation. I'm telling you now, you know, when you begin to live a life of sin, you get farther and farther away from God to where now you're not hearing from God. You don't want to hear from God. You don't want to be around the people of God, all because sin is in your life. Sin, it brings a separation. And I'm telling you now, when you begin to separate from God, you begin to lose the joy of the Lord in your life. The Bible says in John 15, to abide in me and I will abide in you. He said, you shall bring forth fruit. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, kindness. And the enemy knows if he can detach you from the presence of God, from the vine, then he knows you will not have joy in your life. You will not have peace in your life. And a lot of us are in that state right now where we've drifted away and allowed the enemy to separate us 
from God. And now we have no joy, no peace in our lives. So now that I got you all depressed, <laughs> let me tell you about the good news. The breaking news is really the good news of Jesus Christ. And the good news is basically that Jesus saves. Jesus saved. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says that, And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. See, the good news is that Jesus Christ has come to save us. The Bible said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might be saved, not maybe you'll be saved, kind of saved. You will be saved by the grace of God in your life. So I don't want you to be feeling guilty. I don't want you to have this, this shame on your life right now because the sole purpose for Jesus Christ coming here on earth was to save you from that very thing that you're dealing with. Amen. Matter of fact, it said like this, but God in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, a lot of us don't want to really get it, come to church or get right because we're saying that we're waiting on God. We're waiting on, God is waiting on us to get right. No, God is not waiting on you to get right. God came to die while you was in your mess. That's the love of God. He commended his love while we was in it. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. He saves. Amen. John 3, 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Where outside of Christ there's an eternal damnation, eternal uh, of, of hell fire, in Christ there's eternal life. Where I can live with Jesus forever. Come on. Jesus saves. Not only does Jesus save, just saves us from our sins, but he saves us from the penalty of sin. He saves us from the penalty of sins. He commended his love toward us, and that while we was yet sinners, he died for us. The penalty of sin is death. And Jesus Christ took on that death for you. That's the love of God today. He saves. That's the good news, the breaking news. I don't know if you know it, but I wish we would begin to repost and post this, that Jesus is the good news. And he saves. Not only does he save us from the penalty of sin, he saves us from the power of sin. Huh? That's good news. That sin does not have to rule and reign in my life. I don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. I don't have to serve sin anymore. I don't have to, to, to give in to those desires that's pulling me away from God. Because now, God, as a born-again believer, God has filled me with his Holy Spirit, which is the, uh, the Greek word is paraklesis, meaning one that will walk long beside you. In other words, you got somebody in you now that will walk with you through every struggle that you're going through. And you can rely on him and say, I need help in this situation. That's the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Not only does Jesus save us from our sins, but he also reconciles. Jesus also reconciles us back to God. Romans, Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says, For if 
When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also have the joy in, in God. The joy of the Lord is restored back now through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Reconciliation. God reconciles you back to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Reconciliation just means that you're made friends with God. You're made friends with God, and Jesus came to reconcile us. In other words, God is not mad at you. God is no longer mad at you because Jesus has reconciled you or made you friends with God. You know what I mean? My wife, you know, when we have our disagreements and I have to sleep on the couch. <laughs> There's nothing like the makeup. When I get to come back to bed, <laughs> glory to God, reconcile back to my bed. Amen. But that's what God has done for us. God has reconciled us back to Jesus Christ where now we don't have to be separated from the joy, the peace, the love, the power of God. Now we're reconciled back to God and now we have all of this available to us as born again believers. Somebody needs to be reconciled today, and that's, that's what Jesus came for, so you can have access back unto the Father. Amen. No need to feel down on yourself. Just be reconciled. He said that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the God we serve. He loves us just that much. Amen. Amen. Not only does he save us, not only does he reconcile us, but Jesus also justifies. He justifies us back to God. Justification simply means just as if I had not sinned. Come on, just as if I had not sinned. Romans chapter 4. 5 verse 8 and 9 says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved from the wrath of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because God, Jesus' blood has justified us. In other words, he's saying that my blood was enough. He's justified you. It's like a lawyer in a courtroom that's fighting for your case. The enemy, the devil, he's the adversary. He's constantly throwing uh, 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 negativity to God towards you, saying how bad you are. But Jesus is saying, I took that. That sin in his life, that sin in her life, I took that upon myself. Amen. They're justified. And now because we're justified, the Bible says in, 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 in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And you see, you can't have peace of God until you have peace with God. And a lot of us been trying to find the peace of God, but you don't have the peace with God. And I'm telling you now, there's nothing like the peace of God. And the world can't give it to you. That peace only comes by a relationship with Jesus Christ. He want to give you that peace today. Not only does he save us, not only does Jesus reconcile us, he don't just justify us, but the good news is that he satisfies. Jesus satisfies. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 
says, my little children, believers, dear ones, I am writing you these things so that you would not sin and violate God's law. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate who will intercede for us with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, the upright, the just one, who conforms to the Father's will in every way, purpose, thought, and action. And he, that same Jesus, here's the word for you, the propitiation. Come on, look that up. The propitiation for our sins, the atoning sacrifice that holds back the wrath of God that would otherwise be directed at us because of our sinful nature, our worldliness, our lifestyle, and not for ours alone, but also for the sins of all believers throughout the whole world. Jesus satisfies the wrath of God over your life. You don't have to feel condemned, live in condemnation. The Bible says there is therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You don't have to feel guilty about your past life. Jesus satisfies the wrath of God. Not only does he satisfy just the wrath of God, but he satisfies your soul. Jesus give you a soul satisfaction. He say, I am the bread of life. I am the living waters. Oftentimes, we try to find satisfaction everywhere else but Jesus. We try to find satisfaction in, in, in fame and success and money and worldly things, you know, drugs and alcohol and all of this stuff. Sex and friends and peers and co-workers, all of this stuff, all of these people, all of these things, I try to find satisfaction in, but you can't find it nowhere but in Jesus. Because you was created to have a relationship with God. And you will never, hear me, never be satisfied until you begin to have a relationship with Jesus Christ in your life. I've tried everything. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't satisfy. Solomon, the wisest man ever lived, the richest man that ever lived, he had it all. A king, over a thousand wives, all the gold you can ever want, all the wealth you could ever have. He had it. And at the end of his life, he said, vanity of vanity. It's all vanity. He said it was purposeless. It didn't satisfy. You can be CEO of a company, it won't satisfy you. You can win the lottery, it, it will not satisfy you. Worldly success does not give you satisfaction. Satisfaction, God, leave. <laughs> satisfaction. Satisfaction, there it is. Satisfaction. <laughs> Only Jesus can give you satisfaction. And some of us today been chasing it in all the wrong places. Jesus want to satisfy you today. Let us bow our heads.